Um, today, during our webinar, we will um, address another case. It's about Colombia, and we are very pleased and grateful for the participation of the next speakers. They are both from the association called ACOC, as Acción Colectiva de Objectores y Objectoras de Cosciencia. It's a civil society organization, and um, there is the participation of men and women who have been building and promoting alternatives to militarism, to the militarization of society and patriarchy in Colombia for more than 10 years. The purpose is to contribute to the strengthening of the legal, political, pedagogical, and communicative capacities of communities to confront recruitment and the militarization of the youth lives. Um, they promote nonviolence and conscientious objection and work to contribute to the construction of a culture of peace. They work on the legal area and they um, work for the legal and political recognition of the right to conscientious objection in order to eliminate compulsory military service in Colombia. I'm pleased to present the two speakers. We have Mariceli Parada Abril. She is a conscientious objector herself, a human rights defender and a lawyer. And she has been trained in law, communication, alternative to violence, conflict resolution um, with a gender approach and theology. She has worked in the promotion and search for guarantees for the exercise of the right to freedom of conscience, conscientious objection, and the application of due process in the administrative proceedings aimed at defining the military status of young people in Colombia. And um, she, um, she is the, currently the legal representative of the organization. And her colleague, Saul Alonso Santa Maria Quiroga is a lawyer and uh, he is a specialist in conscientious, in contentious administrative law and uh, also um, works on the political legal accompaniment team of ACOC. His professional experience has been developed within the framework of political legal accompaniment for the defense of the rights of young people at risk of recruitment and in the accompaniment of conscientious objectors in their process of formal recognition. He, hold, he, he has also carried out investigative research in the development of his work in defense of the human rights of young people. So now we are pleased to, to hear from them. And we thank them for being here. Uh, in Colombia, it's early morning. So this webinar is uh, quite uh, demanding for our presenters and we thank all of them. Thank you. Today, we want to talk to you about the arbitrary detentions by the Colombian military. I would like to start by saying that in Colombia, conscientious objection to the military service was established in 2009 with a law 6729. There were ma major uh, mobilizations in order to uh, ask from the government to enable people to reject participating in war without any consequences. However, the government, which is in charge of so the military, which is the authority which is in charge of recruiting members, denied this request based on the fact that there is no legislation that would enable them to do that. So in the years following 2009, when the decision C728 was um, issued, we had to wait until the decision C879 was uh, emitted in order to recognize a conscientious objection in Colombia. It is therefore important to take into account that the Congress of the Republic emitted that decision in order to, uh, as a response to the pressure from different human rights organizations, both national and international, which were claiming um, 
the this these kind of measures for uh, uh, consensus objectives. So how has this new law been implemented in the country since this law was approved? 840 cases of uh, consensus objectives were presented. 602 of these cases were recognized as consensus objections and the rest were denied. Of all those that were denied, only seven were appealed. Nine, sorry, nine were appealed, seven of which were approved and accepted. This has been the result of a lot of uh, legal work that's been carried out in order to recognize consensus objection as a right in Colombia. If the number of requests is very high, it is true that we need to say that the official data is not taking into account all the real requests that are being presented. Very few of those cases are actually being taken into account, are going through all the different processes. All these cases usually have four elements in common. In, first of all, consensus objectors have lots of uh, different difficulties and uh, prerequisites in order to be able to present their case. In, Secondly, those requests that are initially approved and that go through this initial screening are not taken to the um, authority which has the competency to deal with their case. Thirdly, once the process is initiated and the case is studied, sometimes the case is left unattended indefinitely. And finally, when the consensus objector receives an answer, and if the case is rejected, the authority in charge of this case usually uses different measures to try and avoid this case leading to a final um, sentence. You must not forget this because the support that people, members of this, or participants in this room um, have helped us, but we need to take into account all these different um, problems because in cases, um, the emergency, for example, of the, the COVID emergency has been used an excuse to stop or to prevent a resolution to certain cases. So this has, needs to be taken into account. What happens with those cases which are successful, we need to take into account that in most cases, uh, we needed the help of a judge for the uh, consensus objector to be recognized as such. So it is always important to take into account the importance, the role of a judge and the help of lawyers. So the process is not very, uh, uh, is, is not really helpful and doesn't always lead to a successful result. So we need to take into account that we are faced with the following problems when taking into account what the Colombian government has done regarding of, of consensus objection. We currently have a structure where the consensus objector has to present their objection to a technical body. The problem is that this body is mostly composed of members of the military, which is the same entity or body that uh, is in charge of conscription. So this is a bit contradictory. It doesn't make any sense that the same body that is in charge of conscription uh, through a quota system, and which every year uh, conscripts between 20 and 30,000 um, men and women, it cannot be in charge of deciding who is a consensus objector. This doesn't make any sense because this is not objective and lacks independence. Regarding the right to consensus objection, we need to say that this is not just a formality. It is important to take this into account as a real objection. And it's a right that people have in the Colombian um, society. And as long as it's not considered as such, it won't be taken seriously by the authorities. 
Constantemente la objeción de conciencia. Conscientious objection is always limited. And I'd like in this now to mention the case of Sergio Sainz, who requested to be recognized as a conscientious objector, but his request was rejected because it was said that he wasn't part of a church and there was nothing that certified that could prove that his arguments were true and faithful. So basically, we are faced with different challenges in order to be able to actually be reconsidered as a consistent objector. Uh, a cook wants to um, provide you with these recommendations. First of all, we need to take into account the different interdisciplinary measures that are available to consensus objectors. Regarding strategic litigation, we have tried to raise awareness between the youth to explain that uh, consensus objection cases are not independent and that it is a real right and freedom that all people should have. It is important to use strategic litigation in order to try and find alternatives to try and end with the competency of the military authorities to decide on consensus objection cases. And this is something is, uh, that we can still doing. And now I would like to talk to you about arbitrary detentions. Well, my colleague is going to talk to you about that. Arbitrary detentions. We have been able to move forward regarding arbitrary detentions. And we have been faced with many challenges as well. But let me talk to you about it briefly. We started doing this work in 2007, 2008. This uh, was started by organizations Medellin and it led to a decision uh, which was issued in 2008 with the presentation of three cases of three consensus objectives who were uh, arbitrarily detained. Until up to that point, we always heard about raids and arbitrary detentions and that, but at the time, it used to happen with the military patrols that would go out on the streets and would stop anyone who didn't have uh, the appropriate documentation uh, saying that they'd already um, completed their military service. In Colombia, it's always been said that anyone that doesn't have their military card is at risk of being taken uh, and especially those who have not um, been uh, presented, didn't, didn't attend to um, a request to uh, join the military. So it was always believed that these people were at risk of being recruited at any time. But then there's Article 11 that establishes that all Colombians have to undergo the military service if they're aged between 18 and 50. However, this is the, the legislation that we had at the time. Nowadays, this is still happening even though we have um, moved forward with, and things have changed since 2007. This decision uh, the, of, of 2008 continued um, being amended and uh, with the support of WRI and other organizations, as well as with some of the agencies of the UN. We were able to obtain a different outcome and this led to a permanent dialogue with the High Commissioner of the United Nations, which helped from then on to include that issue within all the different agencies within Colombia to be so that it could um, have a positive effect. 
we requested the, for arbitrary detentions to be considered and declared as unconstitutional. The result was decision 879-2011, where the constitutional court said that it could not be understood a point in the law 43 could not be um, considered as um, uh, the military authorities having competency to carry out those raids in order to identify people that had not completed the military service. And this could not lead to arbitrary detention. So basically that article uh, was banning that kind of practice. Further on, another aspect was uh, added to all of this, and is that we presented two different cases. It was a guardianship case, and it led to another decision, which established and ratified once again that these kind of raids, these practices, which were a type of arbitrary detention, were illegal and they were very similar to some other times of detentions, administrative detentions, which uh, are some sort of crime really. So it was ratified that these types of procedures are not allowed by the constitutional. So there was a request for them to be declared unconstitutional because they were affecting uh, personal freedoms. And this led to the um, Constitutional Court to establish that uh, the military authorities did not have the competency to, to carry out these sort of actions. We used the help of different anti-militarists uh, to accompany different objectives and all the victims, all these practices, and this helped also include or, or use the pressure of the uh, civil society to be able to and make sure that it was made clear that this type of practices by the military was illegal. This empowered all of us and it also enabled us to use legal mechanisms and resources and uh, for those to be used by the youth including also a dialogue with the media and different representatives, congressmen and women in Colombia. Another key point was the participation of different other district bodies uh, who, who also helped uh, with denouncing all these actions. However, even though we have succeeded in all this and the new conscription law includes a ban that says that in, under no circumstances may someone be uh, detained arbitrarily uh, and no one in Colombia can be detained down the street. In practice, this is very different because these raids and these detentions continue to happen in Colombia. There was a very important lobby that helped us and taught us different lessons. And that lobby continues to work. However, we need to take into account that the situation has changed greatly as a result of the COVID pandemic. So all this reality has changed and it has um, shifted the focus onto different other issues. So the problem now is not that um, this issue of arbitrary detentions um, is changing. The problem is that the focus is being shifted elsewhere and the practices are changing but they are still there and lots of the youth can still be recruited through that conscription. And the worst thing is that uh, the perpetrators are 
not being um, judged and there's a lot of impunity there is also a lot of legal uh, sorry uh, verbal and uh, physical abuse against those that have been conscripted through those raids and lots of people are still being invited to uh, address the military situation by being given a card a military card where when they're walking down the street then they when they um, go to their appointment um, they are recruited unless they are sometimes accompanied by people members of our association who try and help these um, youth and then uh, in some cases uh, these people are obliged they're forced to sign certain documents under pressure and um, I'm going to try and avoid um, saying lots of the things that I wanted to say since we don't have enough time but I would like to add that uh, for example there's a case where someone on the day of the 18th birthday were recruited into the military and uh, they were given that um, military card last year uh, the second half of last year the military of colombia made public the need that they needed to add uh, new members to the military they needed new conscriptions but the problems that we've seen when we've accompanied different people the youth over these past 10 years we know that the only way in which they can continue um, having uh, the same number of um, members in the military through those cons that conscription those uh, through those conscription practices through those arbitrary detentions and those raids because as you'll see what we've been able to attain through the those campaigns is to stop the transfer of the youth from in, in lorries without complying with all the different requisites of those processes but in reality we are facing an issue and it is that it's very difficult to prove what is happening now they are still being conscripted they're still being recruited but in a very indirect way so now it's very difficult to identify those cases and to prove these illegal practices and it's difficult to prove to the public opinion that these uh, youth are being arbitrarily detained and that's what i wanted to share with you because in reality these arbitrary detentions are still happening and it's they're happening against the very vulnerable youth Many organizations are speaking up about this, but the military is still illegally recruiting youth through arbitrary detentions. And this is making very difficult to provide real figures and real statistics. We have presented different requests to the military and to the Ministry of Defense, but we are always told that they don't have any registries, no cases, of any claims regarding these arbitrary detentions. In 2018, we received a list of the different cases, about 20 cases of arbitrary detentions, but that cannot be a real figure. So this is what we wanted to talk to you about, to explain how we are trying to create a new strategy and we want to do this through strategic litigation we want to use this strategy to try and find new conditions that can help the youth in colombia that will enable them to well we can help them and guarantee uh, a future for them